So how did you prefer yourself when you prepared for the audition of James Bond? Well, I read the scene. I'm a man who's uh, is whipping the shit out of another man's balls. <laughs> <laughs> So you played a dealer, a pastor, a doctor, you played a composer, a viking. What do you like so much about playing so many identities? I think most actors like it when, when they're a scene with different eyes, so we get an opportunity to try a variety of, of characters. But the things you mentioned, they were jobs. It's, it's more about what's inside the character, and the character can obviously be a doctor and a hairdresser and have the same kind of character traits. Uh, but I've been very fortunate that I've been offered a lot of different, different characters in my life. But what do you like so much in being an actor? Because it's a pleasure for you to be an actor when you are on the set. Mm, I wouldn't say I'm... It's a job, and, and, I, and I'm really focused, and I'm very dedicated to my job when I do it. But it's not like, it's not a lifestyle. I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh my God, I'm an actor. That's my identity. I, I don't have that gene. I find it very important when we do films. But uh, if Barcelona calls me tomorrow and asks me to play football, I'll do it. Mm, I would like to go back when you were a teenager mm -hmm. and when you saw Taxi Driver. Mm -hmm. What was your first reaction? I was shocked uh, because normally when the films I was watching was always like, that's a good guy and that's a bad guy. And this guy was just an idiot and I liked him and then I didn't like him and then I liked him. And so the film was manipulating me and I realized that's so much more what life is like. You know, it just opened my mind and my eyes to like filmmaking is much more than just black and white. So in a way, can you say that Taxi Driver was a good way to embody the good guys, the bad guys you've played during your career? Yeah, it's been very inspirational. Uh, De Niro is, is, is masterful in it and, and it's one of Scorsese's best films, I think. It's just very clear that you could, you could let people leave the movie theater with a lot of questions and think a lot, as opposed to just give them an answer and they would go home. Just to come back a little bit, uh, before being an actor, you were uh, a gymnast mm -hmm. and then a dancer. What can you say about that period? Gymnast, I was just a kid, a uh, grown-up teenager. So that was just my life. I never thought about it. I was, I was fine, but I wasn't, I wasn't going to the Olympics or anything. And then I became a dancer, and, and there was not so many male dancers. Oh. And all of a sudden, I was... I was a little more than fine. I was working all the time and it was really fun and I bumped into theater and drama uh, and that was a completely new world that opened up for me. I had never dreamt about. I read that you made a comparison between you and the character of Billy Elliot. Why don't you join in? Uh. In some ways it was obviously because where he's He's a little kid from a working class area and he's, he's, a, he's a boxer. And I was also from a working class area and, and it was a little difficult for me to tell my friends that I had become a dancer. Which also was a surprise to me because it had happened as a, as a, as a random thing. Eventually I had to tell them that what I was doing and then when they knew there was almost no boys and there was a lot of beautiful girls, they all wanted to be dancers, so it was fine. And someone of your... No, they never managed. They didn't have the talent, no. but they wanted to. In which way the skills uh, that you got uh, through mm -hmm. dancing and through gymnastics mm -hmm. uh, bring you something new when you were an actor? I have a physical awareness in a room and, and, and I also, I think maybe unconsciously, work with the speed of a character, how heavy, how light he is. But why it really comes in handy is when you do stunts. <coughs> I've done, done a lot of crazy stunts in my life, but I've done a few things lately when I'm much older than I should be. For instance, the entire film of Polar, there are so many, many crazy stunts in that film, and I still have, uh, I still have scars to prove it. <laughs> We are in 1995. What's your first reaction when you are meeting uh, with uh, Nicholas Winding Griffin? That was, he was a, that was a very weird meeting. He wanted to make a film about the drug environment of Copenhagen. And I grew up in that. That was where I grew up. When I met him, I met this kid with glasses and short pants on. And he wanted to make a film about the tough environment. I was like, what is this? But then I, really, I found out really fast that Nicholas is, is, um, is a brilliant visual uh, director. And, and he knows how to pick people to make his idea come up on the big screen. And then he picked me and, then, and then we worked for five times and it's been fantastic. And on the first day of the shooting of Pusher, <coughs> what's your reaction? Are, are you like stressing? Are you... No. 
that was everything I was hoping for. I mean, I was waiting, I think like a lot of other people in my generation were waiting for something a little more rock and roll to happen. Not this polished theatrical way of doing it. Uh, and it was completely rock and roll. The way we were dressed, the way we, we shot the things, with handheld running around, improvising. It was basically everything I was hoping for. Like if I should make a film, it should be that one. And this is a perfect time for Danish movies because yeah. you can feel the energy at that time. Do you, do you feel like yes. something new? Yes, I didn't know the business before that, but I could definitely tell there was a lot of things happening and everybody was inspired by the same kind of films. For me, it was Taxi Driver, for others it was, uh, could be a French, but we wanted to change Danish cinema and, and we wanted to do it in different ways and it all happened at the same time. Well, I'm sorry, that last hand nearly killed me. What do you remember of the audition you I didn't do an audition. I had a meeting and then they called me over to do an audition. Okay. And then I, I was standing there, I was dressed up in a tuxedo and I was supposed to do the very famous scene where I torture him. But because they were looking at all the Bond girls, mm. they didn't have time. So he just came up to me and said, hey, Mass, welcome on board. And then he left and I didn't really understand it. And then he came back and said, oh, you don't understand. You got the job, so you can fuck home again. Mm. And then I was standing with Daniel, he was nervous, he was smoking. And he literally said, okay, so who, who did you fuck? <laughs> because he, he had done six editions, right? So it was a really weird moment. Uh, yeah, so that was, that was my audition, yeah. But why aren't you like stressed to become the next bad guy of James Bond? Well, the secret is here, obviously. At that point, I had never seen a Bond film. Oh yeah? So I didn't have an idea how big it was. I saw them all after that, but I lied and I, I told the director, I've seen them all and I really liked the guy with the whatever. So I, it was not until the premiere uh, in London where there was like, I guess, 50,000 people there. Then I understood the magnitude of the whole thing. You are a funny man, Mr. Bond. Yeah! Yeah! Ah! Valhalla Rising, the movie from Nicholas Winding Refn, I was thinking, was it for you the most difficult movie? At that point, yes. After that, I've done a few that was up there. But it was very tricky because obviously you take one of the very, very big tools from an actor, which is his language, whether it's English or Danish, as long as he talks, right? That was gone. So it became much more of a mythical thing than it became a real person. It became more like an idea, a painting. So we had to kind of find a way to do this so he didn't become too human. We couldn't have one eye just sit and be normal and scratch himself and look like that. He had to always be almost in a zen kind of feel. I read that uh, you like to, to watch people. Yeah, especially when I was a kid. And not so much now? Or? No, it's difficult because they're watching me. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, as a kid, it was not because I wanted to be an actor. It was just, you know, if people walk down the street, you can see that in every city, right? Yeah. People who are really weird and they, have, they either have a certain move or they, there's something wrong with them, either physical or mentally. And I always found myself sitting, trying, you know, doing the same thing just to figure out whether I can feel the same. If, I'm, if I do the same movement, would I also feel how they feel? And then I got caught sometimes when people saw me doing it and it was not so good. But, but it was not because I made fun of them. It was just, I was just curious what was going on. If you have a homeless guy that's much older than you and, he, and all of a sudden he sees that you're making fun of him, you have to run. <laughs> I know that you don't come back to your house with your characters, but do you still have something linked to Anibal Lecter years after? Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed that character. Obviously, I, I also the character I stayed with for the longest time, which is, can be very boring, but it was never boring with Hannibal Lecter. He kept surprising. Mm. I always steal something from, from, from the set. I have a couple of his suits, uh, just as a little memorabilia. And when we talk about him, it um, makes me smile and happy again because I enjoyed it. So, so that's what I bring back home, but I, but I don't think about them every day. When you are playing characters, are you understanding why they are so mean or yeah. so good? I have to understand them all the time. I don't have to agree with them, yeah. but I have to understand why, how can they go from A to B? What is their, what they, what is their logic? If I don't understand that, it's, it's difficult to act it. And I'm not sure I can give the, the director you know, that bridge from, yeah. from A to B. So how do you explain that in a lot of movies you have issues with your eyes. The, the easiest way to explain it is that if you want to have something that's very characteristic in a character and you want to see it in the face, it's often the eye, right? The eyes are the, the windows to, to, the, to a person's soul. 
So the eyes are obviously very, very important in, in movie making. Yeah, I think I've had it four or five times now. It's a, it's a characteristic, I guess. But I've also been driving cars at least in 30 films, and nobody talks about that. That's true. But, and the important thing for you is to be present and to exist through mm -hmm. a room and to, and to create your own space as an actor. Um, to create a space when you, when you go in as an actor is very important. If your character is nervous, obviously you can bring that in. Mm -hmm. But if your character is the master of the room, if it's his office, you have to have that confidence when you go in. It doesn't matter if you, if you work on a big set and you meet your big idol. If you're the boss in the scene, you have to take your space. But how do you do to be the most confident person in the room? Well, it's little things, you know, that people that are the boss do not have to show everybody else that they're the boss. They're, they're relaxed in their own company. People who start showing the world that they're the boss normally have already lost. Right. <laughs> so that's why Annabelle Lecter or Le Chiffre is very quiet. Very, very comfortable, yeah. I'm afraid I must ask for you back. What? So you made some movies in the United States, The so Clash of Titans, The Three Musketeers, uh, Rogue One. Do you make a difference between being an actor in Europe or being an actor in the United States? No. It's an interesting question because that question I only get from Europeans. I never, have, I never get it from an American. And the thing is that we, we, we keep saying, like, but we are the ones who are making great films, they're just making entertainment. But that's not the case. They made some great films. Just so obviously some of the big blockbusters are, are maybe more in the entertaining end of our business. And La Chasse is what we would call an auteur film. Yeah. But it doesn't make it that different for an actor. I mean, I have, a, I have a world and I have to make that world real. So we do Doctor Strange, it's a comic book that's put into a film. Yeah. But we have to make that world real for us. So these are the new frames, and within that world, there are certain rules, and we still go in there and be as crazy and, and as honest with the characters as we would in, in a Danish film like La Chasse. So try not to make the difference. They will be very different films, but as an actor, I will approach it the same way. You cannot walk around in a, in a Bond film or in a Marvel film with a, with a fanboy hat on, <laughs> because then you're just, you're fucked, right? So La Chasse, in 2012, you've won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Eight years later, I don't know, do you sometimes rewatch the movie or rethink about that movie and ask yourself why you, you won the Palme d'Or? I don't watch the films again. Uh, I might watch them if, you know, like a festival like this and we invite it and we might watch it again. We haven't seen it for eight years, it's yeah. fun. But I'm not sitting down watching and learning from it. It, it, it was something we did. Is it difficult like to say, uh, at that time in 2012, I did my best mm -hmm. for that movie and sometimes did you have the same question for a movie maybe you don't like? Maybe it's... No, I've, I've, I've done other films where I thought, um, come on, give me an Oscar. Uh, why don't you, can't you see it? <laughs> I've also done other films where I did get an, an award where I was like, ah, no reason for that one. But, so, so that doesn't work like that. The, the, the latest film, Thomas's film, I'm as happy with that, if not more happy with this. And what was your reaction when you at first read the script? Because you read the script and every character is like drinking all the time. Yeah, I was in, I was in love with that idea. I mean, who of us do not recognize that something beautiful happens after two glasses of wine? that you cannot live your entire life like that, it's not a secret, but they, they give it a shot and see if, if it can, you know, recharge their batteries and to a degree it can. Did you have to really drink during the scenes? No, we were, this is not impossible to do. So if you want to stay on the, on the level of, of two glasses of wine, yeah. then you have to, after 10 hours, you have to drink 20 because you have to keep doing it, right? And sometimes when you film, obviously you have this scene and after that you have another scene where you're driving a car. Uh, it's not gonna happen, right? So no, we were experimenting before. We, uh, we, did, we bought these little meters and then we tested it out and we shot it on video, what happens to the way we speak, what happens to the way we move, and we recorded that and then we watched a lot of YouTube videos with very drunk Russian people uh, because that was very inspiring. So yeah, we couldn't go there, it would be too crazy. If you had to choose one scene that could say a lot about your career, what scene would you choose? I would pick a scene that, that I'm not doing. I would pick a scene uh, of uh, Buster Keaton, who was a big hero of mine. And, and I remember when I was a kid, I saw him. He was always in love with a girl, and there was always something. It's not me, I'm just very inspired by how fantastic you can get away with, with him not, not crying, not smiling, but just 
being honest and we can all read into it what we wanted. Uh, so it's been 25 years you are an actor mm -hmm. since Pusher. Oh, yeah, yeah, 1996, but I, I mean... got an anniversary. <laughs> I didn't know that. What is the most important thing you've learned as an actor? I don't know yet, because I'm still learning a lot of things. So, but intuition is a very important player in this. And the times I've said yes to something where my intuition was... It's a little messy. It's, it, people have said, you shouldn't do that, because I know that he's a little... Uh, but I had a feeling that there's something interesting and beautiful about this. I was right. I mean, it might not have been the greatest thing I've ever done some of the times, but, but I was right, it was interesting, and it was worth doing. So intuition is a good thing. It, it, it can go wrong. I'm not gonna say, it, it's not only intuition, but it's good. And also when you're afraid of, of like, something wrong about this, get out. <laughs>